Hey, Scott, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you, Lee? I'm doing really well. Uh, for people listening, we've got a little bit of a uh, mic issue on Scott's end here. So uh, we'll do our best and we'll, we'll plow through it. Hopefully you can turn the volume up and hear him. Um, but, uh, you know. And just tell not, me periodically if you need me to speak louder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's not, uh, let's not waste the hour. Um, we will get straight into it. So, Scott. For people who haven't read your book and, and don't really know too much about you, um, let's go back uh, in time. And you've had quite a challenging childhood, to say the least. And yes. what were some of the most challenging things that happened to you as a child for people who are not listening? And, and what is it about those um, challenging events that have really made you the man you are today? Well, the most challenging event was losing my parents when I was 14. They were shot to death in Detroit in a market that they owned, kind of a fruit, fruit market convenience store. Um, so that, I mean, that, that's obviously been the most challenging, well, maybe not obviously, but the most challenging experience of my life. I also grew up with uh, um, a brother who was addicted to heroin and who ended up ODing and dying on heroin nine years after my parents died. Um, I also grew up with a father who was addicted to gambling. So there was a lot of, um, a lot of addiction in, in my household growing up and then losing my parents. I mean, it's, to answer your question, like how did that impact the man I am? I'm sure it's impacted me in so many ways that I'm not even aware of. I mean, the path that I've been on for many years and the work that I'm doing is rooted in my belief that love is the most transformative power we have to work with in our lives. And that when we connect to love, first and foremost, self-love and then love of others and all that that invites into our lives, we have the greatest chance of leading a life that is more aligned with peace and joy and meaning. So how did losing my parents affect that? I mean, I see that, um, I feel like who I am today, I wouldn't be who I am today. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a sense of my resilience and strength as a human being today had I not been able to survive the loss of my parents in the way that I did. And had I not been able to forgive the man who killed them, which was an incredibly, powerful and important part of my growth, I think, in healing in my life. Um, I think that my relationship, I know that my relationship with my siblings is, um, I'm the youngest of seven, six who are living after my brother died, but I, I truly believe we have a, 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 a beautiful closeness and I don't think it would have been that way had we not all lost our parents in the way that we lost them. You know, so I reflect I think it's really important the perspective with which we view our lives and I don't I could never say I'm grateful for losing my parents and at the same time I can reflect on the gifts that came from having endured something like that one of which was the closeness that I now have with my siblings um, the forgiveness that I was able to to achieve the resilience and strength that I see you know what I'm saying and I think that so often we we reflect on our past, especially the hard parts of our past, the traumas, we look at it through this lens of um, just, can I say, is swearing okay on this podcast? Fuck I. Okay, okay. <laughs> you know, we just see the shit and we just, we, we focus on the ways that it's fucked us up. We focus on the ways that it's kept us, that it's prevented us from living the best possible life or from making braver choices. And I think that, that our mind is always going to go there naturally. It's always going to seek out the shit naturally. And that's not really where we need to put our energy. That's not really where the work is involved. The work is, is also bringing to our past and to our traumas and to our griefs and to everything a lens that also recognizes the gifts that come from that, that is willing to recognize, had I not gone through all that, I wouldn't be able to do this and this and this today in my life. You know, so it's not necessarily with gratitude for what happened, but it's with an acknowledgement that even though that happened, there's still a way to view that with some 
perspective and understanding that I am who I am today because of it. And there's a lot of beauty that happened because that horrible thing happened in my life. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, two things, two things that come out of that that interest me that I, I, I see in people sometimes. One is the, the identification with trauma as being part of who we are, our personality. Mm-hmm. So if I, if I am, if I am the, um, if I am the person with a mental illness who is really screwed up because I've had so much trauma in my life and, and I can't really cope with it and I can't cope with life. So I'm still living with my mom at the age of 45 or whatever, mm-hmm. then getting free of that and healing. Sometimes I, I get the impression that the person is afraid to heal because if they do, they'll lose their entire identity. So it's like, mm-hmm. holy shit. So now, now if, if I can, change the perspective on my life and my past and, and focus on the love and gratitude and all the things that you just said to turn it around. Who am I? Like, yeah. did, did, have you recognized that on your travels? Yeah, absolutely. I've recognized it in myself too. It, I feel like we're even, we're, um, we're more comfortable even in the discomfort. Sometimes we're more comfortable in our pain because it's the more familiar place. So even to expand beyond it and invite new realities into our lives is scary because at least in our trauma and in our pain, we know who we are. It's exactly what you're saying. I think that happens for a lot of people. And I think what I've come to notice is that my, my, my traumas in my life absolutely do affect my personality they absolutely do play into who I am. At the same time, what I've, what I've realized is I don't have to allow them to define everything about me. I can acknowledge that, of course, my parents were murdered when I was 14. You don't just wrap that up in a bow and find closure with that. I, I certainly have been. You know, I'm 47 now. This is 33 years ago. And there's still moments in my life where I will grieve my parents. You know, it's not a, by any means a daily thing, you know, but sometimes I still hit on that grief. And, and even before my parents died, I had a really, um, destructive relationship with my father. I felt incredibly unloved and unseen by him. And what I'm noticing in my life now is some, sometimes that relationship, even before their death, is a thing that has impacted my personality more than ever, especially in my current relationship with my partner now. And I think that that all we can ultimately do, Lee, in my experience, is bring as much awareness to who we are and how we're choosing to show up, shine as much light on the, the ugly bullshit aspects of our personality as we do on the parts of us that are easy to see, like the parts of us that are generous and beautiful. You know, can we, can we shine the light on all of it and at least be honest that this is what's going on for me. And this is what is, and this is perhaps why. And, and what I found in my life that when I can be honest with who I am, I'm less likely to be attached to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. um, Certainly. I mean, I'm thinking, you're 14, your parents die, and, you know, at some stage in your life, maybe a, a decade later, who, who knows, something happens to flip the switch. So you become less identified with um, Scott the victim mm. to Scott the crusader, we'll call you, right? You know, it's like you must have at some point I have a thought, fuck it, I'm not going to live my life like this anymore and I, I'm going to turn this into some sort of good. Yeah. Or it just happened by accident. But, but what was the tipping point? Or, or sometimes when I speak to people, there's, there's like something that happened, like they read a book or they watched a, a motivational speaker, or it was a gradual kind of thing. How did you become Scott Stabile when a lot of people like that example I just give you with a 40-odd-year-old still living in their parents' house today yeah. They could, they will watch this and they'll go away and they still won't be able to get away from their past. Like what, what changed for you? I'll say a couple of things. One, as a teenager, um, after it happened, I really, I can't take credit for how I chose to live my life in that moment because it was, 
I was so young and it was so shocking that I don't think I was doing anything with much consciousness. You know, and I, I was like a straight A student and a really popular kid and went to a good college. Like I stayed on that path instead of going the fuck you life, fuck you God, none of this is worth it path. Mm. But it, and I feel so grateful that something within me during my high school years knew to just be like, just keep doing what you're doing. And I think in part, one of the things that potentially helped me stay on that straight arrow path was seeing my brother who was like immersed in his addiction to heroin and making terrible choices and in and out of prison and living a life that I couldn't even begin to imagine. So I think somehow seeing that scared me into just like being a really good kid but as far as, as, as far as what you're speaking to, in my 20s, I got a job at this new age gift shop in San Francisco. I moved after college from Michigan to San Francisco, got a job in this, in this gift shop, and it had an incredible book section. And I was working with people who were talking a lot about love and peace and enlightenment. And I was reading these books for the first time in my life that were speaking to these themes. And I had never, never consciously I'd never heard the word enlightenment, honestly, before that. I was probably 23. And I'm reading these authors who are talking about the power and value of living our lives from love and focusing on it and, and facing our darkness and being honest with our pain. And it was life-changing for me. That really was, it wasn't an overnight switch, but it was over the course of many months, like with the connections I was making and the books I was reading, I, I, I st started to see you know what, there is a different way to live life. I don't have to be so focused on career and money and all of these other things. I can actually focus my energy on being a more loving and kind and compassionate person and see where that focus leads me. And, and one of the places it led me, which was incredibly healing for me in terms of my parents, was it led me to understand that I can no longer look at the man who murdered them in the same way because when I would think about him it was just with rage and hatred and wanting him to die a brutal death and and once I started reading these books and opening up to a different way of being I understood the toll that those thoughts were taking on me and how they were affecting me and depleting me in a physical and emotional way and I didn't know necessarily how I would find my way to forgiveness, but I understood for the first time that I had to create space for it, you know, and that was life changing. And the way I did create space for it and ultimately found my way to forgiveness was through empathy, through being willing to empathize with this man and see him not just as a killer, but as another human being and as another brother on this planet who is, who feels unloved and unseen and lost and confused and angry and I could relate to all those things, you know? It's like I knew what it felt like to feel unseen and unloved and angry. And it changed my whole, um, my whole relationship to him. And it changed my life, really. Because when we're not, you know, part of trauma, I think, for people is when we're on the receiving end, when we are a victim to something traumatic, what, what the conditioning that we receive the information that we receive from the outside world is that what we've experienced is unforgivable and that it is not, it's not an option to forgive the person who perpetrated whatever trauma it is we were victim of. And I came to understand that that's not true. Like love tells me forgive, you know, that things are not unforgivable. And if I'm choosing to live in that energy of unforgiveness, all I'm doing is hurting myself emotionally and physically. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, unbelievably. I mean, there's, there's two things that you said then that I want to press on a little bit more. But on, on the forgiveness angle, uh, when I'm not helping people become people mm -hmm. who don't drink alcohol, I work in the poker industry. And um, I write... Did you I, say I, polka or poker? Poker. Not poker. Okay, uh, polka. Not, like, not polka. the poker industry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, although that would be interesting to give it a go if I wasn't married, but um, no, the, the, the poker industry. So I interview high stakes poker players and oh. I, I write articles about poker for the poker. Community. No, I thought you said polka like the Polish music. Oh. <laughs> gotcha. I got gotcha you now. I'm with you. Okay. I'll have to check that out. I'll have to check that out. No, I work in a poker industry and a few years ago now, 
There's a guy called Eric Lindgren, E-Dog, they call him. And uh, he used to be a very, very famous poker player back in the day. Um, but he developed a gambling addiction. And he stole, uh, I don't want to say stolen is the wrong word, um, but he, he, he built up a lot of debt, like millions of pounds worth of debt, and was unable to pay people back. And then out of desperation, he then started behaving, you know, in very unsavory ways in order to avoid paying back those debts, that kind of stuff. And, and I wrote an article as a former gambling addict myself, coming from the place of empathy, you know, let, because he, he then came back and then he won like two major tournaments. And I, and, I, and I was thinking, wow, that must take a lot of bollocks to come back from, from knowing, knowing that he screwed everybody over because he went to Gambling Anonymous or whatever they call it. And, and maybe we should have a look about addiction here. And, you know, maybe there's a way to find forgiveness for this guy, you know? <laughs> Fucking hell, if I did. Like, Twitter blew up. Like, you know, oh, so you're going to uh, forgive Hitler. You're going to forgive pedophiles. You're going to forgive murderers. And, and it was quite clear to me that particularly in this group of people that I was speaking to in the poker industry, were very rational and logically thinkers, you know? Um, forgiving people was not a, a core value that was... I shouldn't say naturally humans, you know, like there's a foundation of the way we behave and then yeah. we change the way we behave and evolve. So like, you know, I, I, and to me, it seemed like forgiveness is something that we evolve into. It's not something that's part of our human nature. That's been my experience. Um, the reason that I forgive everybody is because I am always seeking forgiveness. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, so I, I feel that with that pain in myself when I've done something wrong and I, and I'm desperately want someone to forgive me. So I, um, that then turns into empathy for me to forgive other people. So, yeah. yeah so how then, um, you, you said about creating space, how, because the, 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 the guy that killed your parents, right? Mm -hmm. He's the villain in your story. Heroin is a villain in your story as well. There'll be other villains. Everybody's got a villain in their story. How, how, how are they able to create space? What advice can we give to people to turn from unforgiving people to forgiving people? I really think it's empathy. You know, I'll say one thing to what you said also is that I actually do believe we're forgiving at our core. I, I believe who we are. I believe we are beings of love. You know, I, I really believe that. And I think what ultimately happens in our lifetime is from a very, very young age, we just get piles of bullshit conditioning put on top of us. I think we learn not to forgive people. We learn not to love people. We learn to condemn people. You know, this is all learned behavior. I don't think it's who we are before we learn it. And so for me, the whole idea of love and the whole idea of forgiveness, the whole idea of becoming a more compassionate human being is it, it doesn't, it's not about fixing ourselves. It's really just about remembering who we were to begin with and peeling away all of those bullshit layers and all of that outside messaging that is trying to tell us to be and think and do like everyone else. When we check in with our heart, it doesn't resonate. You know, these messages of don't forgive, don't forgive, it's all mental. That's all ego. When you really check in with yourself, when you really go to the place within you that's within all of us, that is love and compassion and understanding, the only messages that I feel there anyway are forgive, love, forgive, love. So to answer your question, my, my experience, empathy is the path. It's the only path I've, it's, it's the main path I found to forgiveness. It's like when I take an empathy, we're born with that too, but that's absolutely something we can practice at. Like forgiveness isn't one of those things. I think it's of the mandates of love. It's one of the hardest. You can't just call it out of the sky, you know, like I want to forgive right now. And it, it, it takes work. Empathy on the other hand is easy. Empathy is, is just a conscious choice to put yourself in the shoes of another person. You know, taking the time, 10 seconds, to imagine what it's like to live in the experience of another human being. And I found in my life that the moment I do that, it's impossible for me to show up 
in that relationship with hatred in my heart because I've actually taken the time to think, my God, this person has been through this, has survived this. And even though what they're doing and saying right now, I find offensive and disgusting and whatever else, and I don't condone it, I can still see their humanity behind it, right? And when we take the time to do that, and by the way, first and foremost with ourselves, because any of that energy we're giving to ourselves, we're gonna be more likely to give to other people. And we don't have to guess at our own experience. We know it, we've lived it. You know what I mean? For you to empathize with your experience of, of being addicted to gambling, you can look at all of the different things that brought you there because you've lived it, right? And if, if we can't, look, I, I believe that it's often said, like you can't love another person if you can't love yourself. And I don't believe that. I believe we're constantly loving other people in ways that are more open to the love that we give ourselves. But I absolutely believe that the more we love ourselves, the more love we have to give in general to the people in our lives and to the world. So if you want to forgive, how are you doing with yourself? How are you doing with your self-forgiveness? Mm -hmm. Start there. I think there's, a, there's almost always a direct correlation between what we're willing to offer others and what we're willing to offer ourselves. On the empathy part, I'm very definitely one of those people who was not born to be very empathetic. Um, I, I, I always, I'm like, it's always me, 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 uh -huh. you know? And, 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 and it, for me, in order to get into, in order to have empathy, you've got to stop thinking about yourself. Uh -huh. I, and, and very often for me, what stops me, even today, even today is, no, no, I need to defend myself right now, which, which blocks me from empathy. And, and my, my learning about empathy, like it comes in two stages for me. There's catching it in the moment, and then there's almost like consequential empathy. It's like I've just really upset somebody, <laughs> and I've just had a big fight, and I'm blaming them completely. And then after a while, I'm then kind of saying to myself, okay 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 i i i can see where they're coming from right now and i'm in a continual battle to make empathy my natural state so mm. i can stop having conflict and one of the things that has come up for me and, I, and i'll ask you about it is status so so you're quite right if i turn around and say i can find great empathy with this guy eric lindgren because i used to be a gambling addict there's a fear there that people will recognize that. So, so, so if I have... We'll recognize what? Recognize the same flaw within myself for finding empathy in the other person. So, okay. I, so I, I've often wondered if status stops people from going there a lot when it comes to forgiveness and that stage of empathy. You know, I don't want other people to look at me and think of me any less of me if I have empathy with Donald Trump or if I have empathy with Charles Manson or if I have empathy with, in your case, the people who killed my parents, you know, yeah. like it's a status issue there. It's like, I don't want, I don't, it's almost like forgiveness at, to a, like a real serious degree. <clears throat> it's frowned upon like, yeah. oh, you're some sort of new age hippie or whatever. And how can you forgive murderers and pedophiles, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Well, of course it's coming from a place of love, but, but, you're worried that people aren't going to recognize that and you don't want to shift into that state because you don't want your status to drop in terms of your hierarchical social status. Um, do you have any thoughts on that at all? Yeah, I mean, I hear you. I feel you. I, um, I think that ultimately, you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing now and my writing and speaking and stuff is about self-love. And the thing about status is that when we, I feel like when we're more connected to our worth, when, we're, when we have an understanding that who we are as we are without needing to change a thing about us, that we are as worthy as any other human being on the planet, that that's how we are born and that's how we are, will die. And that when we remember that and that when we are more centered in that understanding, that there is nothing that, that I can do that will make me any less worthy, I'm more likely to be present in my truth in the world. And if my truth is that I believe in absolute forgiveness of everyone, yes, 
even Hitler, yes, Mussolini, yes, pedophiles, yes, everyone. Um, and understand that, that that's my truth. And people can judge me for my truth. They're going to judge me anyway. You're going to be judged no matter whether you live in a box of conditioning and are not willing to say what's real for you or whether you're out there free in the world being as authentic as you can possibly be. And I just remind myself, knowing that I will get judgment anyway, why wouldn't I be operating in my deepest truth? And the thing about that, Lee, is if you're willing to say to people, yes, I, forgive, I can forgive a pedophile even, that's an incredibly powerful example of love in my book. It's not saying, to forgive someone is not to say I condone their actions in any yeah. way. It's not to support what people are doing. It's simply to acknowledge for me that I don't, I have found nothing on this earth in this existence that is more powerful than the energy of love. And I know that when I am choosing forgiveness, I am first and foremost allowing myself to live in the most peaceful way possible. Now people can read that. Well, what about the people who have suffered? They're not living in peace. And I understand all that, but it's like where I don't see any downside to forgiveness. That's the thing. I don't see any downside to it. All it ultimately does for me when I'm forgiving the, the seemingly unforgivable in my life, like the man who murdered my parents, forgiving him untethered me to the pain of my relationship with him. I will always have a relationship with this man energetically. He played a big part in my life. But the difference for me between now, when I was 20, my relationship with him was, I hate him, I want him to die. That takes a toll on you, mm. emotionally and physically. Now my relationship with him is, I sent him love. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't be such a big advocate for love if it didn't feel good to love. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like, this is what helps us feel the most whole. And so to you, I would say you need to decide what's more important to you. you. How you are perceived by the outside world, how your status in the world is perceived, or how you're feeling within yourself based on the choices you're making in your life. And, and, and that's something that we all need to decide for ourselves all the time. You know, we make so many concessions, so many comp compromises throughout our lives to appeal to people, to not be judged. I've done it. Look, I have a for many years now have had a presence on on social media and i've gone through that story all the time how is this going to be received when i post this and and not everyone's going to like it and not everybody does and ultimately it's like who the fuck cares it's like how how much are you honoring your truth in this world and trusting that by doing so you are going to encourage others to do so and trusting that you will connect with the people that you need to connect with and those who need to receive your message will receive it. You know, I feel like I'm screaming because of the microphone issues. Does it sound like screaming? No, no. Okay. I'm glad you are. I'm glad you are because I, I, you know, I have to really focus on it. You know, and okay. I just hope it comes out and people can hear it. But um, no, it, scream away. It's better to scream. Okay. All right. I, I was asked a question. I was talking to a, a teenager who had uh, suicidal tendencies uh, a while back, and they were talking about the question of good and evil and how these, this thought that there was, a, there was good in the world and there was evil in the world <clears throat> was, was, was almost part of the, the puzzle, was part of the reason why they were having a great difficulty existing in the world. And this person asked me if I, if I thought there was evil in the world. And I thought about it and I, and, and I said, I'll have to come back to you on that. And, and, I, and I slept on it a little bit and, and, I, and I, you know, I came back with the... the with the decision that I didn't think there was evil in the world. Like I, I thought that behind every evil act, there is a, there is a reason, there is something going on that either biologically or psychologically, um, you will be able to get into some sort of empathic state about how that began. Okay. Then that's not condoning all the horrific things that go on in the world, but, but surely even Adolf thought what he was doing was right. And there was a reason why he thought he was doing was right that none of us, a lot of us don't agree with. Um, but, but for me, not thinking about evil in different terms and being able to say, well, no, 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 no. I think every case deserves to be looked at objectively. 
um, and empathically has helped me a great deal in order to foster forgiveness, in order to um, grow my stores of empathy, uh, practice empathy. Uh, but it doesn't come naturally to me, Scott, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. I, I, I find it very, very difficult. Um, and, and my issues are a lot of the times around, there's just two things. One is exter externalization and getting my value from external sources. Uh, I still struggle with that a little bit. So the mm. status thing is an issue. And then there's this very powerful dominant force within me who is very much my dad like you know um, of who a man should be uh -huh. but even though I know it's wrong rationally and logically I know that it's it's wrong and it's not who I want to be it it, it it always overpowers me when I get into a conflict situation and it takes me a long time to get into an empathic state I'm fortunate that I can do it and I'm able to fight with my wife and then afterwards we can talk about it and I'm able to go back in that state. But she must be really tired and fed up with the fact that I can't seem to get there as quick as she would possibly like me to get there. Um, yeah. I, it's not a quick thing, right? Please tell me it's not a, it's not a, quick, it's not a quick thing for everyone. Give me hope. Well, I think what you're saying is totally normal. And I think it's, you know, I, I feel like I'm an incredibly empathetic person and I don't go there instantly necessarily if I'm being provoked by somebody. You know, sometimes, sometimes I ask myself the question often throughout the day, you know, what is love inviting me to do in this moment? And that, that, that single question is the thing that helps me get out of the impulse to rage at someone. You know what I'm saying? But I don't necessarily in the moment go to empathy with everyone who's in front of me. Sometimes my answer to that question, what does love invite me to do, is just disengage. It's just to recognize that what I have to offer this situation right now is not positive because I'm not able to, to bring empathy to the moment. So why do I need to participate? I think one of the things that we can learn is just to be really aware of who we are in the moment and what we will offer. And if what we have to offer is just more toxicity to something that's already burning out of control, step back, you know? Okay, take, I'm going to use a gambling analogy here, right? So... <clears throat> When I used to play poker, um, if I lost emotional control in a game, I would start chasing. And, and again, rationally and logically, I knew that was the wrong thing to do, but emotions would always trump rational and logical, right? You have to explain what that means to me, though, chasing. Is that oh, a poker So, so I, would, uh, I would make poor decisions and plays gambling, because poker is a game of luck and skill. So you can, you can play very skillfully, or you can gamble. Okay. Right. So, so if the odds are not in my favor right now in this hand, I can, I should fold. Yeah. But if I'm down a thousand and I want to get a thousand back, I could gamble here and go for it because I want to get my money back. So I used to do that. And then afterwards, when I would review my game, Scott, I would say to myself, wow, you know, Lee, you did it again. You, you gambled instead of playing the probabilities, right? Stop doing it, but I couldn't stop doing it. So then I would write on a card. And I would put the card in my wallet and I would tell myself, when you're going to gamble and you lose control, get your card out and read it, right? But I would never get it out. I'd never get the card out. So my question to you, Scott, is because this is a real issue for me now. When you say, what is love inviting me to do now? How do you create a habit so that becomes at the forefront of your mind when <clears> you're <throat> just about to throw the shit into the fan? Because that... that that is what I'm struggling with. I'm able to say that after I've caused the conflict, not before. So how do you get that to be your modus operandi? I think practice. I think awareness. I think, you know what I mean? Like for me, awareness is always the first step of everything. You say that you're not a naturally empathetic person. You know, so what I would encourage you to do is to, to look at those moments when you're not choosing empathy versus when you are and how do you feel in each of those situations like what i've come to discover is that when i'm operating from a place of empathy and compassion i feel way more grounded i feel way more relaxed in my body you know so when we start paying attention to what's happening for us 
when we're in the mode that we don't necessarily like to be in. And I suspect if you pay attention to those moments when you're not being empathetic, when you're being more re reactionary, when you're being more like how you were trained to be a male, which, I, which I'm inferring from how you talked about it means more aggressive, more combative. Check in with yourself. How does that feel? It feels like shit. Your body's probably keyed up. Your mind's doing this. You're angry. That doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good for any of us. And when we start to really look at that and recognize this is how I'm feeling when I make this choice. And then when you get to the point, maybe it's a day or two later, or hours later with your wife, where you're actually able to come at the situation with more empathy and more compassion, pay attention. How are you feeling in your body? How are you feeling physically? How are you feeling emotionally? When we start bringing more awareness to our physicality, our emotionality, emotionality, is that a word? You know what I mean? <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what you mean. When we start bringing more awareness to how we're actually feeling based on the actions that we're taking in our lives, we're more likely to be inclined to take actions that actually serve a feeling of peace and happiness and meaning. And that is one of the main things I like to remind people is that we, we don't always have control of our thoughts. It's like if someone pisses you off, your first thing, you're going to have a thousand thoughts of like, fuck you, you motherfucker, whatever it is, wherever you go in your head, that's our impulse. That's where our mind goes naturally. But the moment we have awareness, of our thoughts, we can actually stop and make a different choice. And that choice might be initially just to disengage, just to recognize, I don't have anything to offer this conversation. So I'm not going to participate. Honey, I love you. And, and can we talk about this later? I feel like what I have to offer right now is no good. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I understand that this isn't the easiest thing to do when everything's happening, but like we have to start somewhere. And I think the first place is awareness. Like what I have to offer is shit, make a different choice. And that's where I feel like our power lives in the choices that we make, right? That's where our power lives. And that's where my hope lives. It's in knowing that at any time I can choose differently. And so if I, if I continuously pay attention to the choices I'm making in my life, which is, I mean, the path to sobriety, the path to recovery is, is choice after choice after choice after choice. Every minute of every day, choosing to stay sober, choosing to walk the path of recovery. I mean, I feel like recovering addicts know the power of choice as well or better than anybody because they're having to make that choice constantly, right? But that's where our power lives and we can apply that to every area of our lives, to the way that we're, to the way that we're connecting with ourselves, you know, to the way that we're connecting with other people. And, and the thing about it is, you know, I often talk about this path of growth, of healing, whatever you want to call it, self-help, personal development. I, I refer to it as work because it is work. Mm. Because our minds are so naturally self-abusive. They're so naturally condemning of other people that the work, we don't have to put any energy into being more negative and more self-abusive and more judgmental. That happens very naturally. The work is in actually manipulating our thoughts in a different direction. And the moment we're aware that they're going down that path of like, fuck you to ourselves or another person, we can interrupt that process and make a different choice. But we have to, we have to, we have to do it. It takes more than just awareness. It takes action. So I don't have like this, I don't have this quick fix panacea for you where you can take this pill and suddenly you're going to be empathetic in the moment. I haven't figured that out. If you can figure that out, bottle it and you'll be a multimillionaire. The reality is we're human beings. And the reality is when someone's in our face pissing us off, our gut reaction is to react, respond with anger. You know, that's, that's just the nature of being human. Mm -hmm. Now I'm much better. I go to empathy much quicker than I ever have. I go to love much quicker than I ever have, but I'm also a giant asshole sometimes. And I could, I could put my partner in here to talk to you and he, he, you'll see he's the recipient of most of my asshole behavior. You know what I'm saying? And that's human. All we can ultimately do in those moments is find our way to an apology as quickly as possible and, and get back centered to love and empathy and compassion as fast as possible. 
and within it all be gentle with ourselves. You cannot give me the um, get with quick get get uh, get better quick scheme the pill, but you have given me reassurance. You know, mm. so I just want to um, reflect on some of the things you said there that I that I think that could that have, will help me and, and will certainly help the audience. Um, one one of the things uh, that Scott talked about there was awareness. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, as, as you will all know, listening to this, my, my philosophy around the truth of, al truth of alcohol is the three modules to our intensive experience. The first one is truth. We have to learn the truth of alcohol. What's number two, folks? It's awareness, right? We have to raise awareness of what is going on, you know, internally. So we've been programmed from birth to think that alcohol, drinking alcohol is normal. We've been programmed from birth to... Um, think that alcohol is a fucking nuts that it's absolutely brilliant it's amazing it's the best thing to taste bread and then as you get older you think that alcohol cures so many different ills or is an answer to so many of your problems right well of course when we understand the truth about alcohol we we realize that a lot a lot of those things are just illusions or they're just stories that we've just adopted for no reason and we raise awareness with those things in order for, to change the way that we're thinking about alcohol and that's how we stop awareness is super key when we first stop drinking alcohol you know, boom, suddenly that fog lifts and we can be more aware about the choice, the other choices we're making in our life outside of our addictions. Why am I in this relationship that isn't serving me? Why am I in this job that's making me so upset? Why am I uh, upsetting my children? Why am I just sitting down watching Netflix all the time? So if we want to reach this state of love, we want to reach this state of being a really beautiful, empathic person, then awareness is certainly key. And you are more likely to gain a greater awareness if you stop drinking alcohol and you seek out other people who think like that. So Scott said earlier on, and he talks about this in his book, Big Love, about him working in the bookshop. Yes, education is great and brilliant. And we weren't taught these things at school. And like Scott says, this is, do, this is work. And it is work. And he said, an educational, wonderful piece of work. Mm -hmm. um, but we weren't taught this in school. But the education is out there on the internet, you know. Many of you will say, I stopped drinking because I read Alan Carr's Easy Way to Control Alcohol. I read Annie Grace's This Naked Mind or I, uh, you know, whatever other book you read that, that, that had a light bulb moment. But the people who really go on are the ones who surround themselves with a community. And Scott said he was in a bookshop, so he's educated himself literally. But he's also got people around him where he can say, hey, hang on a minute. Can you tell me a little bit more about this kind of love and meditation and yoga, et cetera, et cetera? So I think that was really important. The other thing you said to me there, Scott, was when you said about it doesn't feel good when you have a go at someone, there's a part of me that was thinking, yeah, it does. It feels fucking brilliant because it, because it accentuates my dominant right to be a fucking man. So, like, if I shout and scream at my wife, I'm, like, being a man. Like, I'm putting her in her place because that's my blueprint, and I feel good. But, but that's a temporary psychological feel good. What you just draw my attention to that I've never thought about before is the physicality of anger and aggression and how much energy that's sapping from me, how much that's weakening my system over time, and how much, if you think more longer term and short term, physically, you're going to wreck your body and your mind by constantly being in that state. So that, that really super helped me. And the last thing I wanted to say was... You said if you brought your partner in and, uh, and, I, and, and I started asking him about the big love, Scott, he would just turn around and, and give me all your asshole bits. Um, <laughs> it's important that we recognize that the reason that our partners, and I'll ask your opinion on this, minute, the reason that our partners know the deep, deepest, darkest sides of us is we love them so much to, to show them our true selves and, and, to, and to be an asshole with them. We love them so much that we will be an arsehole in front of them. We will just let rip and let them see our bad sides as well as our good sides, where sometimes with the rest of the world, we kind of, we, we can be as authentic as we want to be, but we don't really act like an arsehole as much as we can do when we want to, but we will with those that we love dearest. I just wanted to throw that in there. So is there anything there that I said about that you want to comment on at all? Yeah, I mean, also with the partner thing, it's that 
we're, we tend to be around them the most. So it makes a thousand percent sense that the person you're around the most is going to annoy and frustrate and provoke you and push all your buttons, you know? And yes, it, it, if we're lucky enough to feel safe with that person and the love you're speaking of, we feel like we can show whatever it is we need, you know, we need to show or feel compelled to show in the moment. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to say one thing about, you brought up evil earlier. And I just wanted to say to that, you know, when I hear the word evil, I think of the devil. And I don't believe there's a devil operating, you know, on this planet to manipulate things. Um, but I do believe that there, there's great darkness on this planet and, it, and within each of us. So I, I, I absolutely do believe that the things people do are, are horrific and disgusting and and I mean, if you define evil in that way, then certainly evil. Even if I can trace back and, and recognize their humanity and look at why it is they're doing that, um, I think I don't view people necessarily as evil, but I absolutely believe actions as, you know? And I think that, that one of the things that, that I've been working with a lot in general in my life, and especially these past couple of years because of political realities in this country, is really checking in with myself and recognizing that, that the love that I'm speaking about, it's not a love that's inviting me to be silent in the face of injustice. It's, it's a love that's inviting me to speak up, but to do so in a way that continuously reflects empathy and compassion and kindness, even, even within the anger. You know what I'm saying? I think that sometimes, sometimes people on this, this, I call it a spiritual path, whatever, you know, whatever path it is, however you refer to it, we think that to be loving means we can't participate in dialogues about injustice and all of the fucked up insanity that exists in this world. And I don't think that that's true. I'm really, I'm really trying to learn how to be a participant, but to be one who centers myself in the energy of love, no matter what it is I'm choosing to offer or no matter what, what causes or I'm choosing to support, you know, because I have found in looking at, you know, we've talked a bit about empathy and I feel like there's a real scarcity of empathy in our country, especially in the U S especially. And, and I don't want to contribute to that. I don't think it's necessary. I think that we can be a, we can be a voice for justice in a way that doesn't dehumanize others, even if those others are choosing to dehumanize us, you know, so I'm trying, I'm trying to be a voice for a different example. Yeah, I, um, I hear you on that. There are, there are, <clears throat> there are, there are so many different things going on in the world and, mm -hmm. and, what we, I often talk about this is uh, it was something that I learned from uh, Michael Beckwith uh, over in the Agape Spiritual mm -hmm. Church in LA is, is you, you, you need to be aware of everything that's going on in the world. You know, that makes sense. It can help you from an IQ standpoint, from an EQ standpoint, like be aware, but just be very selective over what you choose to be interested in, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I certainly agree with you that we can, definitely be interested in like a lot of different different political dramas that are going on in the world in america at the moment and also in the uk with brexit and stuff but but very definitely come from continue to practice coming from those places from a state of empathy like all the time you know um so yeah i think that is like super important and um, you you talked earlier on about and you you write about it in your book about <clears throat> the relationship that you had with your brother um, who sadly uh, passed away with, uh, through heroin. And there are a lot of people uh, in our community who they stop drinking and then their partners don't. So, you know, they have to come home every day and they, they, they come on to Strive, our community forum, or they'll watch something like this and they'll, they'll be really upbeat and they'll be around people who are like them and, and uh, they have the same values with like, you know, uh, integrity and uh, health and wellness and all that. You know, it's really now they, they've brought them to the fore and then they'll go home and, uh, you know, their husband will just be sat in the chair with his big beer gut, swigging his cans, watching a football. Or the wife will be there, you know, chugging on her wine with a little trinkets on the champagne flutes. Mm. And they find really difficult 
to deal with that and, of, and often that leads to a lot of uh, judgment and a lot of conflict. Um, what advice could you give to them? It might again just be empathy, but you know, I'll ask you the question, how can we set boundaries there, loving boundaries in order for us to um, obviously communicate with these people about how we're feeling, but in a way that is not going to raise their ire and we can evolve as a relationship? Well, first and foremost, I think when you're talking about seeking out community the way that, that you all are, that's uh, critically important. You know, I think that we put pressure on ourselves to find we want everything to come from our partner. We want our partners to meet all of our needs, and that never happens, not just in the world of addiction, but in general, right? So the needs that are not being met, we have to seek them out in other places. And if your sobriety, is of utmost importance to you, you know, and I hope it is, if that's something you're choosing for yourself, then you need to seek that out, outside of the context of your relationship, if your partner's not, if your partner's still choosing to drink or do drugs or whatever else is going on. So, so first and foremost, find what you need in other people. Don't hold your partner to meet all of your needs. As far as then, look, if you, I think we do two things. I think we do one thing often, which is we blame. We put our, we, we point at our partner, we point our fingers at them and blame them for the misery or the frustration or whatever else we're experiencing in our lives. And the moment we do that, we, we take all of our power away, right? There's no, there's no power in blame. We have to take responsibility for the choices we're making. So if I am a person who is deeply, un if I'm in a place in my sobriety where it doesn't affect me, if my partner's drinking, I'm not, I should, I should say one, I'm not a sober person. So that's not my reality. Um, I also am not, do, am not someone who feels I'm addicted to alcohol or drugs. Yeah. Um, so if I, if I am living in sobriety and feel like that's totally, doesn't bother me for my partner to drink, great. If I'm living in sobriety and I feel like being, my partner's drinking, is really affecting me in a negative way, then I absolutely have to say something. But the something that I would say is not, you're an asshole for drinking in front of me knowing that I'm sober. That's not real, it's probably not gonna lead to a positive outcome. It's like, how can I take ownership? And the way that I can take ownership is to simply acknowledge, honey, I love you and I need you to know that, that it's very painful for me. It's very uncomfortable for me I, to be around you when you're drinking. So if you are going to continue to drink, then I need to have space from you in those moments. It's like, like taking ownership in our relationships is the most empowering thing we can do. Because I know that if I can't be around my partner when he's drinking, that's a boundary I need to set. And, and if my partner then, and if the boundary is, I cannot be around you while you're drinking, then my partner needs to decide, is that a boundary that he or she is comfortable with? And if, if this person is not able to be at dinner with me and not have a drink, even though I've said clearly, I'm not able at this point in my sobriety to be with you while you're drinking, then there's a real issue there, right? There's really something to look at. I would hope, I would hope more often than not, if I'm willing to say, your drinking is your story, and I understand that you, you want to drink, but I can't be around you in, when you are. I would hope my partner would be able to honor that, at, le at the very least in our home or with whatever boundary I set. And if they're not able to, then I need to ask myself, am I able to stay in relationship with someone who's not able to honor this boundary? Which is a, a deeper question, but we always need to be doing that in our relationships with anyone and not just around sobriety. It's like so many people write to me. One of the questions I get asked more often than any other, it's some version of, I'm in a really toxic relationship, what should I do? Mm. And I can't answer that for a person, but the thing that I can reflect back is, if you're in a relationship that you experience as toxic, why are you choosing to stay in that relationship? Why, right? If you have stated your boundaries clearly, which by the way, most of us don't at all, but if you have stated your boundaries clearly and someone in your life is choosing to trample all over those boundaries, why are you choosing to stay in relationship with someone who's not willing to honor your boundaries? 
You know, the truth is most of us don't state our boundaries because we feel like we're being difficult and we don't want to be judged and all of the, for whatever reasons, we don't state our boundaries. But, it, but if you are willing to say, this is what works for me, this is what doesn't work for me then it's out there, then it's respectful for all. I love to know what works for people. I don't wanna be trampling all over people's boundaries. And I also don't want people trampling all over mine. But if I haven't stated them, I can't expect people to know what they are. We are not mind readers, right? And once I have, then I can look at it objectively and say, this person is not treating me with respect. This person is not honoring my needs why am I choosing to be here? Right? I, on that respect issue, I, 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 I was in a toxic relationship. So I was in a, I was in a beautiful relationship that turned toxic. So okay. I, I've been married twice and I was with my first wife for <clears throat> on and off 20, 20 years, something like that. Met as a, knew each other from kids, you know, got married when we was in our twenties and divorced when I stopped drinking around 35. And to answer your question, because it might, it might help people. And I know a lot of you have heard this story before folks, but for those that you haven't, the reason why I stayed in that toxic relationship, right? Here are the reasons that I stayed in that toxic relationship. Just going to think off the top of my head. The type of thoughts that went through my head were, how am I going to split all this shit up? Mm -hmm. Who's going to have the house? What's going to happen to my pension I work really hard for? Um, I'm not going to see my son. My, I cannot abide another man or woman parenting my son or telling him what to do or mm -hmm. reprehanding him or smacking him or, or shouting at him. Um, I cannot abide another man touching my wife's body and sleeping with my wife's body. People are going to think I'm a failure. And there was another part of me deep down, even though I'm not religious, which was taking a vow here and my mum and dad don't like each other and they're still together. So, you know, it, it, it can work out. And then the million dollar one, but I know I, I know I love the person that's, who's not drinking. And that if she stopped drinking and she could change, everything would be all right. So all those reasons, all those things are the reasons why uh, I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't have the balls to leave and make the right decision. Um, and you talked a bit about respect there. I actually think I was being disrespectful by not having the balls to ask for a divorce. I, I agree. I would have been more <laughs> respectful. Yes. I am not going to be able to provide you the love that you need and the support and the happiness and the joy because I'm just so fucking utterly miserable here. So if I'm utterly miserable, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to be able to give you what you need. And that is not respecting you. And, and that's something that I think I read in um, Don Miguel Ruiz, um, the agreements book, which just was like, Oh wow. Sometimes to leave is a, is a absolute ultimate show of respect. I love you so much that I will let you go to live the rest of your life in love with somebody who can give you something I'm incapable of giving it to you, you know? I love that you're bringing that up because that's, that's another thing I remind people is that if you, if you are feeling that you're in a relationship that's toxic, I assure you what you're bringing to that relationship is toxic. Mm -hmm. It's not possible to believe you're in this toxic relationship and to be bringing something positive. So free that person of your toxicity and free yourself of theirs and of what you've created together. I, I 100% agree with what you said. But I'm curious, is that the, was that the awareness that allowed you to move on? Or what, what ultimately, all those fears that went through your head, what ultimately got you to a place where you were ready to end it? This is, this is gonna sound so weak <laughs> and so pathetic, pathetic, but I, I had actually taken a vow that I would stay in that relationship miserable until the end of my life. Okay. Now, saying that vow in that moment is without remembering that I stopped drinking. Like I had stopped drinking for about, I, I, I don't I can't remember, but I'm losing my mind, but I, I, I'd stopped drinking for a little while, maybe like 18 months, two years or something. 
and I'd only just started to wake up. I, 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 I called of 35 years before I stopped drinking, like I was part of the zombification of life. Mm -hmm. I, I was the guy who wanted to be the CEO of the railway because I joined the railway when I was 16 and it was all I knew and I had identified myself as a railwayman. And that the, you know, the signs of power and the sounds of um, status, high status, uh, which was super important to me because I was bullied as a kid as being like Chinese. So status was, has always been an issue for me ever since I was a, a little kid in the playground. I've always had an absolute intense desire to be better than everybody because I was always deemed to be inferior to everybody. So I was never, I was never like, Oh, so everyone's calling me a chink and everyone wants to fight with me and everyone wants to pick on me and everyone mm. wants to call me an English bastard when I moved to Wales. I never thought to myself, I need to get on their parity so I'm on the same wavelength. I was like, I need to get above them so they mm. stop doing this. Not, not I want to get above them because I want the power and I want to pick on them. If I get above them, they'll stop it. So that part of that kind of being is with me today and one of the reasons why I fight because I'm unable to switch into empathy because I'm unwilling to let go of that so-called power, you know, you know. So I, at that time, I, I was just beginning to evolve. I was just beginning to wake up. Like I, I probably didn't have an empathic bone in my body back then. So I'm just starting to learn about life. I'm, I, I didn't even picked up a book, Scott, and read a book, you know. Um, and the first book I read, The Jack Canfield Success Principles, after I'd become sober, it, it led to me quitting a, a 19 year railway on the uh, a career on the railway. I just stopped. I just said, I'm going, I'm not fucking doing this anymore. It's making me sad. I need to find something I love, you know? So maybe in the future, as I would have grown and I would have evolved, I would have created a set of skills and a courage and a bravery to turn around and say, Hey, I'm, I'm not being respectful by staying in this relationship. But in that moment at that time, I was just toolless, powerless. Yeah. I just, didn't, I wasn't able to, um, I wasn't able to change anything. I just, I just, for me, it all comes down to communication. Like, like I didn't know how to communicate. And because I didn't know how to communicate every time I, I, I went to my ex-wife in a, in a, in a, in a, in a way that I wanted to heal, I screwed it up because I just couldn't, I couldn't get into empathy. So fair play to her for having, having the courage and the bravery to turn around to me and say, Lee, I love you dearly, but we need to split up, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, and then Scott, I could tell you within a couple of days of breaking up, even though you, you, I mean, the grief of a uh, ending of a relationship for that long takes many, many years. I mean, it still uh, Im impinges on my life today, but you, there is an absolute sense of freedom and liberation that comes mm. with, ending that relationship. And some people look at that and think, yo, you callous bastard. Like, how can you feel liberation and freedom after that means you didn't love that person? No, no, no means you recognize that you was in a real toxic relationship that was fucking killing you from the inside out. And you don't realize it until you end it. And you're like, whoa, yeah. <laughs> this is what it feels like to not have yeah. to live. It's the same when you stop drinking alcohol. And it's the same when you, um, you leave a, a career that you, you hate. It's, it's the next day you're like, woo, whoa, I never knew that it would feel like this. And if I did, I would have done this a lot earlier, you know? Yeah. And you also see that all those fears, like that list of 10 different fears you have, that like, they don't kill you. You know, it's like we build up in our heads all of these, the, we, we naturally, our minds so naturally go to the negative. So when we're, when we're considering big changes in our lives, we go to the, the disastrous what ifs, right? We go to like, what if I die? What if this horrible thing happens? We go to all the nightmares possible. And that happens naturally. What we need to be giving more energy to are all, the all of the positive possibilities that we can also create, right? And that's, I think that's the work of, of, of growth is recognize, part of the work is recognizing that our mind doesn't need any assistance in being negative it actually needs more assistance in considering the benefits and the positives of the choices we're making and that we have to be intentional and active about doing it or we're just going to get lost and mired in negativity and fear. 
which is what you did. You know, you know? I, I never created a pros and cons list. It was just cons. And the reason it was just cons is because I was so tied up with status <clears throat> that to, to cr even create a list of pros would have, like, I, I'm a guy, and we'll, maybe we can maybe talk about this in, 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 you could probably help me with this, actually. <clears throat> I'm a guy who at the moment is doing a lot of work on guilt. I'm guilty about everything, every, everything I'm guilty. And I'm carrying around this huge, great big backpack full of guilt and it's really causing me some, some damage. And back then, if I was to think about the positives of leaving that relationship, I could have said to myself, wow, um, how beautiful would it be to be in a relationship with someone else who loves me for being someone who doesn't drink alcohol and honors that and does the same thing? How beautiful would it be for me to meet somebody who actually wants another child because my current life doesn't want one? How liberating would it be for me to leave Ogmore Vale, which is a, uh, a little valley of 3,000 people, and actually go and see the world and meet different cultures? How freeing would it be for me to get away from this materialistic existence that is kind of devouring me and this need to wear Gucci this and Armani that? How would it be to not have to worry about looking good in front of people. Mm -hmm. So those things for me come like, for me, they come over time. You have to work at that shit, you know, yeah, like, and, 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 and for me, <clears throat> for me, stopping drinking and creating a strive movement for you, getting into that bookshop and meeting people who are different, super important because without those people who are different to you, Okay, you can read it in books and education is super important as well, but there's nothing like just one on one conversation like me and you are having now, you know? Yeah, and absolutely. All of a sudden, you can say to yourself, well, I, 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 shouldn't, I shouldn't have to feel guilty about this. This, is, this, this. this all feels right. Like, you know, okay, okay, maybe I can feel a little guilty, but it's done. Get over it. Like, I, I, I'm, uh, I'm okay. Everybody yeah. will be okay. My ex wife will be okay. My yeah. children will be okay. They'll, you know, it, you, it's not a reason. Look, just think about what's going to happen to the person or the children or everybody else around you if you stay in this relationship. I mean, um, so yeah, guilt, Scott, like, ah. Uh, it feels I, like hearing you talk about guilt, it feels like it comes back to empathy again, which is, a, which is it seems to be one of your things going on. Because if you're, if you're working on self-empathy, if you're really taking time with yourself to, to, to look at your life, to, to, to acknowledge the reasons why you're making certain choices that you're making or have made that, that is leading to you feeling guilty, you're going to be, le you're going to be a way more compassionate toward yourself and a lot less guilty. You know, and I'm not saying to do this, like this kind of work, it's not, is it, it's not to give us excuses to be assholes in the world we're going to be assholes anyway at times. It's just to simply acknowledge that we don't have to live in the guilt that comes with doing an asshole thing, that we can forgive ourselves. We can understand that we are just human. That has been one of, for me, the most freeing, I guess, mantras and helpful mantras these past years in my life is I'm continuously reminding myself like, Scott, you're just human. It's okay. It's okay that you're feeling this. It's okay that you're, it, you know, whatever it is you're feeling right now, whatever it is you're doing, however much of a loser you feel, you know, it's okay. You're just human. You have a human mind. Everyone else on the planet is dealing with this in their own way based on whatever circumstances that, we're, that they're living. It's okay. Acceptance has been another big word for me these past years. Is really, really, really working on accepting myself as I am for who I am, accepting my life and, and by accepting it instead of, because what we so naturally do is we fight, we fight the reality of our existence. And, and I've learned that to create change in my life, I have a lot more energy when I'm accepting the reality that I'm in. And then I can move forward trying to create change from that place because part of accepting it is accepting. I'm not okay with this. This does not feel good to me. But if all I'm doing is fighting, if all I'm doing is like, no, I don't want this to be happening. No, it's not right. It's unfair. It's da 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 da. All my energy is going into the fight, and nothing is left for me to actually productively create new changes in my life. Right? Yeah. You're giving a lot of energy to your guilt 
it feels like, which isn't creating a lot of space for you to move beyond it. Give some of that energy to empathy. Give some of that energy to the acknowledgement that you're just a fucking human being with a fucking crazy human mind and that you're okay. You know, give some of that energy to compassion. It's almost like um, through my programming when I was a kid that my, my brain spit down the middle and that there's this, uh, there's this like stick man who's bad guy. And then there's another stick man who's good guy. Mm-hmm. And I, I am always trying to veer away from bad guy. Like whatever those rules were when I was a kid, mm-hmm. I'm trying to veer away from them. So, you know, things like, um, you know, if I, if I end this relationship and leave this woman on her own and, and, and my son, uh, then that's bad guy, you know? And it's almost like in order to be at peace with the guilt and the acceptance is to reframe, do some work around reframing and, you know, writing out what a bad guy and a good guy is, you know, and, 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 and looking at it very differently now that I've evolved so much, you know, because like when you said acceptance, there my my sister is my my kid sister is going for a horrific breakup right now and my mum's losing weight and she's getting really sick and ill over what's going on every time i go around there i'm like hey mom how's it going and she's like oh fucking hell you never guess what's just happened with your sister and, and she's you can feel the pain and i said to her the other day in the kitchen i said part of the problem here ma'am, is you believe when two people split up after 20 years of marriage that they should split up amicably they should love each other and they should think about the ch- children uh, and, and that's what they should do. That's what your reality is. But you've never been through a divorce. I have. And the reality is when you go through a divorce, the people fucking hate each other and they use their kids as weapons to hurt each other because they love each other. <laughs> and it's all twisted. It all comes from a pace of love. Two people who love each other, broken hearts, they don't know how to deal with it, so they fucking shoot each other, right? And if you can think about that, ma'am, and look at it from and accept that what's actually happening here is, is supposed to happen, now we can offer them some help and support in a different way. Instead yeah. of going, oh, I wish they would just love each other. I wish. No, no, no. Maybe they need to just go through this. And, and, and we need to give them time and then set up some kind of support network or whatever. But So it sounds like I'm capable of seeing the advice he's saying and imparting on others and anybody listening to this who works with me in Strive and stuff, they would say, well, Lee, you're a massively empathic person. You're a massively accepting person, etc. Et so maybe I'm a little bit hard on myself. Um, but also, you know, for me, it goes to show, Scott, and this is really important for people listening. This all takes time. Like doing the work takes time. What do I mean by time? Like I stopped drinking, what, a decade ago? So here I am a decade later talking to Scott and I'm still like at a fight with my wife a couple of days ago and felt like a right idiot because I was doing it, you know? And, and sometimes I come on here go, and, and thinking to myself, you must think that I'm always fighting with my wife. And I do a lot, but, it, but for me, I'm making progress all the time. Like I said to my wife the other night, I see absolute amazing, beautiful, wonderful progress, but it takes time, Scott, right? It takes a life. It's lifetime. Yeah. It's not, I don't think we ever heal. Uh, it, it not there's it's never wrapped up in a bow that's not my experience you know i i i'm making a career out of talking about love and i can be the biggest asshole i know at times do you know what i'm saying and i think i think that's part of it too though and what you're doing here and why it's so important is just to to honor the truth to honor that like we're not perfect mm. that's not that's that's not necessary nor is it possible and I feel like on, at least on my journey, I, what, I, what I'm absolutely able to acknowledge is that because of the work that I've put in to myself and to, to, the, to love, I am the most loving I've ever been in my life, even though I can be a giant asshole. Yeah. I'm the most peaceful I've ever been in my life, even though I can be incredibly anxious. You know, I'm the most hopeful I've been in my life, even though I can be paralyzed by fear and hopelessness. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like I am seeing the tangible benefits of this intentional work around love and compassion and kindness and authenticity. I'm seeing the, the fruits of it, which is why I'm so committed to it, which is why I make noise for it, because I believe in it, you know, and and but it will be a lifetime journey. I think there's maybe point zero 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 one percent of us out here on this planet who are living in that like blissful 
all is totally good state. You know what I mean? If I get to taste that state for five seconds every month, I'm delighted because I know that that is actually truthfully living within us. And it just inspires me to just keep, keep doing what I'm doing. Keep getting longer hits of that like really truly peaceful, loving place. You know, it's like uh, people who drink alcohol when they're trying to be someone who doesn't drink alcohol. It's like, it's part of the process. Like yeah. if I, if I want to be completely empathic, I mean, okay, let's, let's, let's look at that. Actually, perfection is going to fuck us up, right? We know that perfection uh -oh. is going to fuck us up. There's some, you could say there is some positive aspects to having this perfection because you always drive yourself to get better and better, but you're never going to reach that goal. You're never going to get there. So, so for me to say, like I did earlier on, I'm really striving to be 100% empathic and for that to be my ultimate kind of go-to every time, I'm never going to get there. But, but, but as long as I can gradually see that I'm improving and I know that I'm doing the work every day, which is more important, because if you're not doing the work, then how are you going to improve? Then right. that is really important. And if, you're, if you drink, even though if you come on the intensive or the taster experience here at uh, Trooper Alcohol, and then you take the vow never to drink for the month or you, know, you take the vow never to drink permanently and then you do. It's just understanding and accepting. That's part of the process. That's what happens when you're addicted to a powerful drug. Sometimes it drags you back in. But the most important thing is to recognize the progress that you've made and keep on going. Because very often it will be, I haven't had a drink for four days. And then you have a drink for a day and then all oh, fucking hell breaks loose. But when was the last time you had another drink for four days? It was like 20 years ago. I mean, wow, what a tremendous progress, you know? So I think that's super important. I want to ask you two more things before I let you go, Scott, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, looks like I've screwed up royally and gave every single member of the strike movement the wrong link because nobody's here but me and you. <laughs> oh, they're all... They're all going to shout at me afterwards because there was loads of people going to attend today. They all said they were going to come. Um, so I'm sorry, folks. Um, I'll make it up to you the next time. Uh, but the Oogie Loves. <laughs> I've got to go there. i got to go there. The reason I've got to go there is going what I was just talking about. Somebody who drinks alcohol, let's say they go a month not drinking after not doing that for so long. They join Strive. They pay to do the intensive or the taster experience. They develop really good, strong relationships. They start to change things in their lives and then they drink. And then they have a serious case of the fuck it and they go off on a bender for one or two weeks and then they find it really difficult to get back because they think they're a failure. They, they're thinking shame has overtaken them, et cetera, et cetera, right? What I loved about the Ugulov story, and you can share it with them in, in a moment, as I was reading it, and you were going on about, you were saying, I mean, the first thing was, you said, you'd written this script. And I said to myself, wow, he's written, a, he's written a fucking script. And then he said, well, then I sold it. And I, I imagine you didn't sell it for fucking two Bob Aitney, right? You must have sold it for a lot of money. And I was thinking, he sold a script. <laughs> so it was really good at the end of it to realize you then turn around and go, all right, the movie weren't a success, but what a success I was in terms of what I accomplished. So just tell the people listening to us who haven't read Big Love, what happened around Oogie Loves? Because there is a reason why I'm asking. Yeah, I mean, the Oogie Loves is a, a movie that came out in 2012 and I wrote the script for it. And it is still to this day, the worst performing extra wide release movie in history in the United States. So it's the biggest bomb of all time. So, you know, literally, like there were numerous um, theaters with zero people showing up for this movie. Um, so it was a really painful experience in my life. That chapter in the book is really talking about failure yeah. and how we, how we choose to define failure and how I came to understand success and failure differently having gone through this experience. Because the, the inclination in many of us can be when you experience such a, such a failure in a, in a public way is to not try again, you know? And yet, yet we know going through life that we're, we're constantly going through failures, quote unquote, and that any success is built upon a mountain of failures. I mean, you're referencing drinking. It's like, yes, can we acknowledge we, I just went four days without drinking any alcohol, which is something I have not done. That is a profound success where we naturally focus is, but then after the fourth day I drank. So I failed at trying to not drink once again. 
instead of giving some energy to the fact that we actually succeeded for a time. With the Yuki Loves Out, you know, my, ex my experience, I don't know what, what, what really you want me to talk about, but it was really about looking at like, what is most important for me in my life? So, well, with the experience of the film, it was acknowledging, yeah, the film bombed, but I had completely removed myself from the acknowledgement that I completed a script I, as someone who has tons of uncompleted everything in my, you know, scripts, stories, books in my computer, I actually finished a script and sold a script and the script was turned into a movie. And there was a lot to celebrate about this experience instead of holding on to the fact that it ultimately was just a, an epic bomb, you know, yeah. so that was one thing. But it also required me to look at what is, what does success really mean for me in my life? Am I defining my success based on how my creative pursuits do in the world? Or am I defining my success based on how I'm showing up as a human being on this planet? And it forced me to acknowledge that what I, what I really look at as a successful life is like how much love and compassion am I bringing to myself and to the people that I engage with, that that's always going to be more important. And I say that at the same time, so then Big Love comes out, and I go right back into that ego cycle of wanting people to love my book and wanting the book to sell. You know what I mean? So we're a work in progress. Like I know what's most important to me is like, what kind of human being am I? How am I being of service to people in a way that helps them feel better about themselves? These things are always going to be more important to me than how many copies a book sells. And I'm also a human who like wants my book to sell you know, and wants people to love it, yeah. you know, and those, and it's like, the thing I'm learning, Lee, is that like, I can, I can be expansive enough to hold all of those stories in my head. It's like your stick figures, you know, it's, it's like, I can look at the part of my ego that is just consumed with success in comparison and whatever. And what I've realized is like, I can offer that part of myself love too, even though it's not a part I particularly like. We can love everything going on. And what I found is that when I can give love to those ugly parts, they are less inclined to control how I am, how I am acting in my life. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, I what you, the reason I raise the Ugalas is, is like I said, so many people when they take the taste or the intent. So the taster is our monthly program, Scott, for people who want to take action, but they're not sure if they want to stop drinking forever. So we say, come along, let's see if you can do it for 27 days. And our intensive is when we work together for a year for people who are really serious about, I don't never want to drink alcohol again. And, and within that, then people drink, quite regularly you know I don't, I don't know what the numbers are but people will drink i mean they'll 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 drink and when they do they run away you'll know it they'll just disappear from strive and you'll be like ah fucking hell they've had a drink because they feel shame about coming on um and when i read that part in big love that chapter of failure in big love it was beautiful because it showed me that what is really important here and something that i need to incorporate in the intensive is how we frame certain behaviors feelings values in our life so going back to the stick figure so i in my mind have a stick figure and around him are all the different attributes and personality traits that equal a bad person and a good person mm -hmm. those were probably set and created before i was 14 years of age Mm -hmm. So I'm now 44. So isn't it a good time that I busted out those stick figures and I had to look up how, not how it is today, but how do I want my life to be? How do I want, how do I want to view a bad and a good person, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing what I know now. Similarly, how do, how do I define success? Where did that come from? And how do I want to define success going on? And then you can move on to failure and then you can move on to empathy. Then you can move on to, you know, and now we can start really, as you said earlier on, acceptance and awareness about where we are in life and where we want to get to, to just change some of those core ways of being that have been with us for so long and have the patience and the support and, 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 and climbing under the wing of experts like yourself to kind of learn from other people to just change realize in it basically i'm not a fucking kid anymore i don't need to be living 
my life with this kid blueprint. I, can, yeah. I deserve an upgrade because yeah. I'm in my forties, and that and it does normally hit us in our late thirties, early forties, doesn't it? It's like this. People call it the midlife crisis. I think it's just we wake the fuck up and realise that hang on a minute, you know, I've only got another half of this life left. I need to sort myself out. Absolutely. I just t- I just texted my good friend yesterday, and I said, you know, I think I'm going I'm going through some sort of midlife awakening right now, and I don't know if you're gonna like yeah, it. That's what it feels like. It doesn't feel like a crisis. Yeah. It feels it feels. It feels positive. Dude, you know? I'm writing that one down. Mid-life awakening. Because I always say mid-life crisis. No, it's an awakening, brother. I think I just keep saying it because I keep referring, reinforcing to people that I'm in mid-life and I'm not old. Yeah. <laughs> like, I know we're running up to the end of your time, so I want to ask you one more question. This is from Rhonda. Rhonda, was, <laughs> Rhonda posted this question because she couldn't be here live. But as I've screwed it up and no one was here live, Rhonda, you're not alone. Uh, Rhonda asked... Ah, so many of us in Strive have teenage children or, yeah. or kids who are approaching teenage years. And if, if you, I'll, I'll ask anybody, next time you're on a bus or a tube or whatever, just walking down, have a look around you at what people are doing. And you will see 70, 80% of them will be on a mobile phone. And if you yeah. look at what they're looking at, invariably they're looking at Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter or one of the other myriad of social media uh, things and as we know we talked about today how our blueprints that were provided to us by our parents and the stuff that we watch on TV was super important into the choices we make today and it's really more difficult now than ever because yeah. you know this perfection is thrown at you what advice could you give people uh, around love and introducing love and boundaries and when it comes to teenagers and social media? I know that's a super loose question. Well, I'll, you know what? I'll answer from this place. And as someone who doesn't have kids, but watches my nephews and nieces and their relationship with social media and also sees my addiction to my phone and to social media and how it affects my life. You know, I, I feel like, I mean, first and foremost, if you're not a parent who's going to step in and take some sort of ownership over how much time your kid has on social media. I recognize for a lot of parents, that's a choice they're not making. Maybe, maybe because they're, it's so it's difficult to be a teenager and not to be a part of that, those social media communities. I know kids can feel like real outsiders. And I know that there are a lot of parents who don't want their kids to feel like they're they're on the outside of what's happening in the day to day. But I, I feel like we can always um, be really active in how we're cu- curating our social media feeds. You know, if, if you go to my Instagram feed or my Facebook feed, it is, it, it's all pages and people that, that, that add what I believe is something positive to my life. You know, I, I hide I am a, I hide, you know, friends, some Facebook friends, or if, if all that they're sharing is negative and what I feel is, is toxic for me, I don't look at it. Mm. You know, it's like, it's like as an adult, how are we consuming news? It's like checking in once again, how are you feeling? How does it feel when you're tuning into social media? How do these pages make you feel in your physicality? How do they make you feel emotionally? When you check in, if the answer is not good, why are you continuing to follow those feeds? We can't, you know, we can't, you can either, you can either be really active and tell your kids, I will not permit you to look at this, 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 and this. If you're living in my home, whatever, whatever. These are the rules around social media. If you're not going to do that, then you can, you can, by example, encourage your kids to be much more selective about what they're willing to engage with. You know, I, I think those are the those are the things you can do. You can lead by example, or you can set real tangible limitations. You know, and it's tough. It's this is where we're we're surrounded by it. If you're going to be open to it, how do you not how do you not internalize what you're seeing out there? I think as well, Scott, is having conversations with our kids. So, um, I think back to when I was a kid. You know, being raised by my parents they didn't raise very emotionally intelligent and capable human beings. <clears throat> so when it came to our choices in life, it, it's no coincidence that 
two out of four are going through breakup, that two out of four are suffering from mental illness, that, you know, that uh, all four of us have suffered from um, debt issues. It, it, I think it's super important now more than ever to really have a lot of respect for your children. You know, don't have that hierarchy kind of like I'm the boss because I'm the grown up and you're just the kid and, and yeah. to start kind of evening that out a little bit and a wrap with having respectful boundaries in place, but having really solid conversations about these type of things. Like we complain that we didn't have the education when we were younger. Why weren't we taught these things when we were younger? Right. Well, we could teach our children now. Well, you can hear my child screaming in the background. Three, three, yeah. He's a dad. So I think it's really important that we have these conversations. And if we can have these conversations with our children, literally have the night, if we share this 90 minute conversation with our children, but, but put, put the focus on social media, but let's look at the lens of social media through what Scott and Leah just spoke about, about love, empathy, forgiveness, acceptance, awareness. All right. They're not going to 100% get it because that urge to be liked and loved is really going to be there. But if that conversation is going to be consistent, if you're going to be behaving in that way as parents as well, you know, going back to the old divorce question later on, if you are respecting each other, if you are showing that external sources and validation is human, but it's not going to overtake your life, that you're not living a super materialistic life. All of those things are really super important as well, I think, yeah. A thousand percent. I mean, communication is key for sure. And I think that that built into that communication with kids, with our kids in general, I think that we need to really, really hammer the message of self-worth and really, really let our kids know that they are worthy as they are and that their worth can never be defined by what's going on on social media, by what parties they're being left out at or being invited into by how many people like them and don't like them. If we can really ingrain in our kids that message, that understanding that you are worthy, you are enough, that is indisputable, that's not up for argument, that, that our kids and ourselves were much more inclined to go into any environment and into our social media feeds and not be so, um, not have our values dictated by what we're seeing on the screens in front of us, a thousand percent. And I'm just going to go and give that advice to a screaming kid. Nick. <laughs> awesome, brother. Saying she can't breathe. I can hear her saying I can't breathe. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> okay. Share right. calming strategies with a two-year-old. So I'm going to go check that out. Scott, it's been a real pleasure. Me too. A little bit longer than anticipated. I'm really sorry the gang didn't get here to ask you questions. I've Another time. But hey, I'm going to love myself. I just say that's part of like being a human screw up man i'm all right with that you know yeah. i'll fix that for next time don't go anywhere scott i'm just going to press record and i'm going to say uh, a big kissy huggy goodbye thanks for listening everybody bye everyone